Thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is David Kai. I'm one of the organizers of Socialist Night School. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, the Metro DC DSA Socialist Night School is a series of sessions that explore basic ideas, concepts, historical, and current events related to socialism. Well, everyone's welcome. These sessions are especially designed for those who are newer to socialism and DSA and the topics covered. Uh, our night school has gone on the notion that organizing political education are not properly understood intentions, but rather mutually reinforcing and essentially interconnected. I'm excited to host our first hybrid event of the year tonight, and I want to thank our fellow hosts, uh, Bull Co-op, um, who are going to talk now. Hi, uh, welcome everyone, and we're very excited to have uh, DSA Night School join us. Uh, just very quickly, the vision of Bull for the last year is to create a community space that can convene conversations like this and offer uh, a selection of books uh, and events. And uh, so we are operating as a pop-up bookstore at the uh, Black-owned Cafe Creative Grounds in 1822 North Capitol. And uh, we would love you to uh, come around, uh, give us suggestions on our events, and also help us reach the goal of having a worker-owned bookstore, cafe, and event space in DC where communities can gather. You can check us out on bol, B-O-L, dot co-op, and we have limited copies on State on Freedom today. Uh, thank you for organizing this event. Thank you. And thanks everyone who's here with us in person, here at the co-op. Thank you to those of you who are on Zoom. Um, tonight's night school is going to be a panel discussion on the new book, State on Freedom. If there are any problems with the audio or video, please let us know in the chat. We have some folks that will be able to help you. If you are in this space and need any assistance, uh, talk to my friend down here at the end of the table. who just got that job. Um, <laughs> we're going to have plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, and in particular, we always want to make sure we have time to talk, some space to talk through what all this means today for us and our own organizing. Um, and at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about how you can get more involved. Um, so next, I want to introduce our panel. Dan Berger is a professor of Comparative Ethnic Studies and Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Scholarship in the School of International Interdisciplinary Arts and, uh, and Sciences in the University of Washington, Bethel. He's a co-editor of the UWB Labor Studies Colloquium and the author of State on Freedom, The Long History of Black Power Through One Family's Journey. Michael Simmons has been a domestic and international human rights activist for 60 years beginning as an organizer for SNCC and later as director of European programs for the American Friends Service Committee. Michael's work has taken him to Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. For 18 years, he co-founded and ran the Rade Salon, an independent human rights learning and discussion program in Budapest, Hungary. He's also taught courses on African American history and US elections at uh, McDaniel College. And finally, Dr. Clarence Hussein is a full professor of political science in the School of International Service at American University where he teaches and researches international human rights, comparative race relations, social movements, and electoral politics. He's written several books, and his writings have appeared in the Washington Post, the Miami Herald, Baltimore Sun, Huffington Post, Black Scholar, Race and Class, and many more. He often appears on PBS, BET, C-SPAN, and other national media. He's lectured in over 40 countries. He's a former co-chair of the Civil Society Committee for the US-Brazil Joint Action Plan to eliminate racial discrimination, a bilateral agreement involving governments and civil society. <coughs> so uh, first, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm uh, just overjoyed. Uh, this is really kind of a family gathering. Uh, Mike and I go way back. Uh, so it's, it's just always great. Uh, Aisha's here, Linda's here. Uh, so you know, just thank you guys so much. Uh, I, I, since this will be recorded, I have to correct. I'm actually at Howard University, so I'm on Howard University <laughs> College. Of uh, and, and I uh, chair the political science department and uh, run our international affairs program. Uh, and this international space is actually where Michael and I like actually hit the ground a lot uh, in Budapest and, and others. And when Mike was with American Friends Service Committee. Uh, we work together on Roma and uh, racial justice issues. Uh, and some of that's in the book. Uh, first, let me congratulate uh, um, uh, Dan and Michael and, uh, um, uh, and Zara on just a great work. This is a tour de force 
of not just two individuals, but a period in American history that's one of the most significant uh, in country's history, one that often gets sort of uh, marginalized, is often kind of uh, pushed to uh, a limited uh, frame of somewhere in the 60s and the early 70s, and then it just sort of disappeared from life. Uh, that's not true in uh, the least stretch. Uh, and there are many scholars who have, who have pointed that out, uh, including uh, Derek uh, Musgrove, who's here, uh, who's written a great book on Washington, D.C., uh, and other work as well. Uh, I have to say, uh, you know, I, Michael and I have been through uh, many, many, many battles, many, many kind of hangouts, uh, but I really got to learn him through uh, this work and really kind of forensic uh, his history uh, that you guys uh, put into the book. And so I have just a billion questions. Uh, also, I want to warn people, I have to leave. I have a hard leave at 7.30, so when you see me slink out the door, uh, that's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, so uh, I guess to begin with, Michael, uh, one of the things that I learned uh, from the book, and I think it's, it would be, it's greatly appreciated, I think, for scholars in this area, is the history of black power before Stokely Carmichael. So there's a way in which 1966, Stokely Carmichael said black power on a march uh, down in Mississippi. Uh, and that scene is sort of remarkable. What the book shows is not only is there an important prehistory, but that Michael was at the center of that. And so if you could just sort of talk about that, uh, this is kind of our opening. Uh, yeah, I want to thank all who have made this possible and uh, excited to be here. So I just want to make that clear at the outset that that um, starting from that that point, um, I really uh, kind of capsulizes myself and Zahar uh, Simmons in terms of um, our work in the civil rights movement. Um, that if it, um, the Clarence put it in a historical context, if you are familiar with um, the uh, published narratives of the uh, civil rights movement, it, it, it kind of, um, those that talk about black power tend to uh, either ignore and or or denigrate uh, some of its, its roots in that um, um, that people know through uh, Kwame Ture, so called Michael back in the 60s. That um, in the uh, late uh, 65, um, a SNCC worker in Tuskegee, Alabama, by the name of Sammy Young, who was a Navy veteran, had gotten um, assassinated for trying to use a, a bathroom um, in uh, late uh, 65. Um, as a result, the, uh, while SNCC had been, um, and I say SNCC, I'm assuming people know, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and, uh, that, um, uh, just so people aren't confused, that, that as a result, uh, while SNCC was always uh, informally anti-war, it had never taken a a public position of opposing the war. And um, and and I had not really addressed international issues at all up to that point. At least not not uh, publicly. So <clears throat> so that SNCC developed a um, a statement on Vietnam and um, all I would like to point out in terms of the uh, SNCC statement that uh, it was more than just Vietnam. It was an anti-imperialist statement that addressed other parts of the world. Um, as a result of, uh, of uh, the statement, the media uh, really just um, treated us like children. It was that we were not allowed to do anything but support U.S. foreign policy and that the the result, the aspect was just unbelievable. The media, um, uh, fellow civil rights organizations all came together to denounce Nick. In that context, our uh, communication director, Julian Bond, um, had gotten elected to the Georgia State House that summer, that uh, previous summer. 
and uh, but he had yet to be inaugur part of the inauguration process. So that uh, when he was asked if he supported the statement, he said he did. And from that point on, the Georgia State House uh, decided that he should not be allowed to take his seat. And in convoluted ways, it reminds me of, I don't want to keep back the book there, <laughs> um, contemporary politics. I mean, it was just a, uh, a, uh, a determination by his fellow legislators for him not to take his seat, and he, and he wasn't allowed to take it. Uh, as a result, that uh, SNCC was a very fluid organization, those who were familiar with it, um, and some of us who were working on various projects around the uh, country from New York to uh, Arkansas to uh, uh, Mississippi were in the uh, uh, SNCC National Office during, the, during <coughs> that time. And we organized, one we organized protests around Samuel Young's death in terms of protests of students in Tuskegee, Alabama. But two, we also um, were in a situation where Julian was forced to run again in order to keep his seat. And uh, it still wasn't clear whether he, he, he would be able to take his seat. But, um, and uh, that uh, we felt, and our attorney, uh, Howard Moore Jr., felt that it was important to get the largest turnout possible, that uh, the black, the African-American community at that point was united enough that nobody ran against Julian. But even with that, the, the, it was important for legal reasons to get a large turnout. And uh, so that um, an eclectic group of stick workers, most of whom didn't even know each other, um, uh, stayed in Atlanta and formed what has, been, what has become known as the Atlanta Project. Uh, uh, one was uh, from Mississippi, Bill Ware, uh, who was headed to far more South Carolina to go to the SCLC leadership training program that was run by Satina Clark. Uh, Zahara Simmons, uh, who is, uh, the book is also uh, um, uh, Armacles of Life. Uh, Zahara had spent over a year and a half in all Mississippi and then from there um, uh, because of the intense pressure that she uh, was under and what I mentioned so hard, I mean she's not here and I really I mean to talk about her in that way really is a good disservice but I'm trying to get to a point because her story is just a dynamic story in of itself I mean that could have been a book, yeah, frankly. Um, but nevertheless, so that as we began to organize, we would, we would um, be at what is known as uh, Five Points in Atlanta. We'd be there from 6, from 5.30, 6 in the morning to uh, maybe 8, 8 in the morning because all of the, uh, particularly uh, domestic workers, African-American women, came into Five Points and then out into the north, north uh, northern parts of Atlanta working in menial uh, jobs in terms of cooking, cleaning for uh, the white people. That we did an enormous effort in, in, in that uh, regard. And then we were living in Atlanta and as SNCC workers, those of you who are familiar with SNCC, that was our only goal. And then we looked around us, we worked in a place called Vine City that if you know Atlanta, the Omni is, has kind of consumed it all. Uh, um, and realized that, that we were living in, in one of the worst areas of, uh, of Atlanta and, and, uh, and that it, we, it was unconscionable of, for us to live there and not do anything. Um, so that we began working on, I mean, the housing was just horrible. The, they barely had paved streets. Uh, the uh, employment level was one of the highest, probably the highest in, in the city. So then we began to organize in Vine City, uh, Atlanta, with various methods. But um, in the process of the organizing, and again, this, this was a group of people who were getting to know each other, let alone where we were. And 
uh, people, um, we began to just share notes late at night, uh, drinking and, um, and socializing. So we began to compare notes to just about the movement, no, no particular um, uh, uh, focus. But as we, the, the more we talked and we recorded these conversations, the more we began to, uh, to uh, realize that there was something lacking within the efforts of the overall civil rights movement. One of the things that, that's, that, that struck me was I used to work in Arkansas prior to that. And um, when I started out in SNCC, and by the end of the summer um, in Arkansas, and not unlike Mississippi and other parts of the uh, South, the um, volunteers had come in from outside of the South. They, or people, people don't have a um, big community gathering thanking us for whatever it is that we've done. And the thing that I noticed is that um, in my situation was that the effusive thanking of the white volunteers and the uh, uh, um, and compared to how the African American volunteers were treated. And again, it's not to counterpose it. We, we're talking about uh, degrees here. And um, oh, please, please, please. Um, so that uh, that that we began to try to, and, and God, God, this is not in any way a criticism of the white volunteers. I mean, it wasn't their fault that this was going on. We began to realize that for the African-American community, that their relationship to the whites who were volunteers as opposed to the African-Americans who were volunteers was fundamentally a difference. This was the first time that many African Americans in, in the areas that we worked were uh, had any peer relationships with white people, um, and but what we began to realize is that it wasn't peer relationship. That that uh, again, totally uh, um, inadvertent, as far as the white volunteers were concerned, the African Americans felt that they had been, that that well. We'll call it a, a missionary kind of uh, uh, feeling about the reality of the white volunteers, and then we began to just, just think about some of the cultural differences. Again, these were not um, countable or attentions; it was just respecting the culture that we were in, and uh, so that rather than the culture just um, trying to acquiesce to us, we were trying to elevate. Um, um, their reality to a level that showed that we respect them. And in that context, we began uh, writing down our thinking. And um, to make this, this long story short, the, 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 the thinking turned out to be what, is, what, what has become known as the Black Consciousness Paper. And, uh, um, and that predated, in fact, we had to fight within the organization to well, it was never accepted in the organization, but but just to even uh, get a hearing on it, and uh, and that that predated uh, the uh, call for Black Power that occurred in Mississippi, and and we also um, were trying to root um, uh, our work much more fundamentally in in the culture of the communities that we were working in. So we had a newspaper we called the a nitty gritty, and that created an enormous internal struggle within SNCC because people felt that the nitty gritty was vulgar and that it uh, it uh, didn't represent the character of the organization. So that can, can I? Can yeah. you, you have to say it's not the paper itself that they thought was vulgar. Right. It's uh, the phrase nitty gritty. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you have to explain that right. because. Yes. When you told me that, it didn't make any sense. Right. I imagine those right. who are younger, both the, uh, younger than, than you, yeah. feel similarly. So why was why was the phrase "nitty gritty" uh, deemed offensive by some, in, or vulgar by some, uh, in SNCC at that time? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can only, I mean, because it wasn't vulgar to me, it's hard to <laughs> to, uh, uh, to articulate it. But uh, people felt that it just wasn't proper. It, it, it that we needed to have a 
a term of what that they would call more uh, dignified. And um, we felt that it was dignified, that uh, the uh, term nitty gritty didn't come from us. It came from the community at large, and not just being where we were working, but 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 beyond. So that um, so that one issue exploded into uh, differences that um, that, uh, that where the work of the Atlanta Project was never respected. Also, that because SNCC had worked in rural areas, there was really the first attempt. Of, um, of the civil rights movement to organize in the urban community, which created a whole another um, set of issues that, that, that we had to address. Being in Atlanta, Georgia, the home of SCLC, the home of both Martin Luther King Sr. and Jr., also created complicated uh, complications for us. So that that is a, probably a long, short history of some of the uh, aspects of uh, the development of black power prior to 66. So all of this is in detail in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Including why Nitty Gritty was controversial, <laughs> things that Michael was kind of not talking about. <laughs> so you have to read this in the book. Uh, so, uh, so Michael kind of casually mentions as he's talking, uh, he mentions Julian Bond, he mentions Stokely Carmichael. Uh, to give you some breadth of who Michael and Zahara interacted with in this period, Malcolm X, John Lewis, Fannie Lou Hamer, Marion Berry, Louis Farrakhan, James Foreman, Muhammad Ali. These were the personalities of an era, several eras, actually. Uh, so I wanted you to, to talk about uh, Malcolm X. So most of us know Malcolm X through the speeches, through the, through the books, through you know movies. Uh, but Michael tells the story of when he first met Michael uh, Malcolm X and where. So can you share that? Yeah, um, yeah. That that I have. Um, well, one passed away, but I had uh, brothers who were uh, fifteen and seventeen years older than me, respectively. And um, um, so that uh, Malcolm X, when he um, got out of jail and began to. Um, uh, moving around the country uh, representing um, Elijah Muhammad um, came to uh, Philadelphia in the early uh, 50s, 52, 53 and by happenstance in terms of me being, having anything to do <coughs> by happenstance he, um, he, he set up a mosque about a block and a half from where I was living um, I mean where I grew up and my um, um, brothers along with a, a, a few other men in the community at the, at the time began to listen and join the Nation of Islam. Because my house was so close to the mosque, they would come by the house and talk about um, Islam and uh, Christianity, etc. Uh, you know, my, my, as I like to tell, my biggest record, the recollection was, you mean to tell me you only pork? More times, you know, but uh, at the time that was a big deal to me. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, so I want to suggest that I was anyway even understood what I was hearing um, in terms of the uh, discussions, my uncles, and the debates, and and whatnot. And uh, but um, but if you fast forward that to ten or twelve years later, I realized that when because. So it was a gap for me in terms of my interaction when Malcolm moved to New York. But my brother lived with Malcolm. My brother and my former sister-in-law lived with Malcolm when they went to New York. And there was a point in my early teenage years when I realized that this person who was now all over the media was the same guy that used to come to my house. And uh, so that, uh, and by then I began to pay attention I was paying attention to Malcolm X, so that um, so that he was a real person to me, a a, a human person. Uh, with with uh, and uh, and at at the time that I began to see him as a political figure, he was uh, just became a paragon for me of of, uh, of the direction that I wanted to 
at least intellectually understand and practically try to be involved, which did not, I mean, that didn't lead me to joining the Nation of Islam at that point, but it led me to clearly follow Malcolm X. Can I add something Please. that, um, so about the book, but also that brings the heart into the conversation uh, a little bit as well. Uh, you know, as Michael mentioned, right, this is a dual biography of, uh, of Michael and of Sahara Simmons, who was born Gwen Robinson. And, you know, I think that example of how uh, Michael met Malcolm shows, you know, there's a lot of serendipity. You know, people who, who are, are known in history as famous and significant are also people who your brothers meet, right? They're, they're also <laughs> like, they're, there are all these sort of serendipitous ways that, that we encounter people who, who are sort of known to history or become known to history. And I think there's, you know, part, part of why I wanted to write this book is sort of knowing uh, Zahara and Michael for, for many years before we ever began work on this. I just knew that both of them had these kinds of fascinating, sometimes deep, sometimes fleeting connections with a wide range of figures who are often treated as separate. You know, and there's a sort of potted way that uh, a lot of Americans approach civil rights and, and black power and just black activism in general that you know juxtaposes Malcolm and, and Martin, right? That sort of juxtaposes a kind of urban uh, black nationalism or urban uh, northern black power and the southern civil rights movement. But actually, when you look at one family's journey, right, you see how, how these things are actually much more together and much more in conversation with each other. And so, you know, just to tell a little bit of Zahara's story, uh, you know, she grew up in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and was raised by her grandmother, who was raised by her grandmother, who had been enslaved. And so, for someone born in you know the mid 1940s, had had as direct a connection to uh, slavery and sort of slave period as as one could have. Just growing up hearing hearing stories about what happened to her her ancestors, um, and you know the, there's a story in the book about her first kind of overt political action, which was this impromptu sit-in that she did uh, after being denied even you know, interviews for a job when she was in high school, um, simply because of the, the apartheid structure of Jim Crow. Um, and then she gets a, a full, and, and, and so she, she just sort of sits down on the bus and, and refuses to leave uh, at the front. And she gets a, a full scholarship to Spelman College, a black women's college in Atlanta, and um, you know, first person in her college to this person in her family to the college. Um, and her grandmother's instructions were to stay away from the movement and to join the first church that she sees. And it just so happened that a friend, new friend of hers, a Spellman, invited her to, to go with her to, to her church where her uh, sister's husband, her brother-in-law, was the pastor. So she does that. She feels very good about, about following her grandmother's instructions. And that church was pastored by Ralph Faber Dabernathy. <laughs> Those of you smiling and chuckling know that Dabernathy was, uh, was sort of King's right-hand man, a member of the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference. And so, right, so already, uh, you know, following one, one directive ultimately puts put, put her in violation of the other. Um, you know, this has become sort of part of how she, she comes to join the movement alongside the sort of steady recruiting of uh, of SNCC organizers throughout the Atlanta University Center of Black Colleges. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, I, I just think th th those kinds of things continue, right? I mean, uh, Sahara um, heard, heard Malcolm X after the, the offices of the Laurel Project that she was working in in Mississippi uh, were burned down, right, which included this uh, amazing library of, um, of materials that people had donated. And so people donated new things, including a record that she put on and you know, was sort of blown away by, by the sort of fiery speech and was you know, wondering who it was and, and how someone could, could, how a black man could say that, say those things about the United States and still be alive and turn out to be Malcolm X. And, and by the time she heard it, he had already been assassinated. Um, but I think these kinds of swirling connections, you know, between North and South, between you know people and projects and ideas that are so often treated as separate, are really should need to be understood together, right? And, and I think when we 
are telling movement story or trying to understand movement stories, people are not static. The sense of evolution and growth and asking new questions and coming into contact with new people who shape your ideas is a part of what, what a, a life on the left looks like, or at least could look like, and, and, and this book certainly does look like. So the, um, uh, so the book beautifully weaves these stories uh, together, uh, Zahara uh, and Michael's. And uh, beautifully, sometimes painfully, right? Because there are challenges. So Zahara challenges some of the misogyny and sexism that emerges out of that period, right? And it's, and it's told very, very well. So can you talk a little bit just about the process of data collection and writing and, and how it came together? Yeah, thanks. <coughs> so. Um, I should say, you know, I met uh, Sahara because we both started at the University of Florida at the same time. Uh, me as a freshman, her as a professor. Uh, and so, you know, th this was a serendipitous uh, connection as well, that she was just a guest speaker in another class. Um, and I was really, you know, it was a, an eye-opening talk to sort of hear her, um, to reflect on her experiences. Um, and then to see some of the gaps between what she was saying and, and what, what the historical literature recorded. So, you know, I worked with her as, you know, throughout my undergrad time. She sort of advised a lot of the activism I was doing, but we also kept in touch afterwards. I moved to Philadelphia when I graduated college and met Michael, and it was sort of a similar, uh, not a hot moment, but you know, similar kind of amazement. Um, and so we, you know, we, I interviewed Michael for, for an earlier book that I wrote about black prison organizing, about some of Michael's experiences in, uh, in jail and prison uh, during the late 60s, early 70s. So we, we had this kind of deep uh, connection already before we ever talked about collaborating on this book. Um, we did a lot of interviews on oral histories. Uh, I feel proud to have been an early adopter of Zoom uh, pre-2020 uh, for some of these conversations that, that we were having. Um, and, you know, uh, I really have to honor and thank and acknowledge all the work that Aisha uh, contributed to, to this project, not only in interviews, but in helping, you know, with some of the personal archives. And, um, but the book is kind of a combination of, you know, years of interviews and conversations with Michael Zahara, interviews and conversations with a number of other people, including uh, Farron, um, but also our archival work that, um, that, that I used to sort of help put them in space and time. Um, so, you know, deep dive through SNCC's papers, um, a lot of work on the American Friends Service Committee, where they both worked for two decades. On, on different issues and different sort of corners of, of AFSC. Um, and you know, so much of the point of the book is that most social change is made by people you've probably never heard of, right? I mean, it's mostly made by people who, um, who don't leave a lot of archival traces, who didn't give, who didn't give the speech on the National Mall. Um, and so some of the, the archival work is just to sort of find what does exist about them. And often, you know, there are several areas where what existed was, was not about them by name, right? So, you know, the researching Michael time in prison, he was part of, uh, there, there was a series of sit-ins and, and other kind of disruptions where a bunch of people got transferred to, uh, from a minimum security to a maximum security prison. And, you know, the coverage of, of that, transfer focused on the famous conscientious objectors to, who were transferred and said things like, this famous person and you know, 12 others got transferred out. Um, Laurel, Mississippi, where Zahara worked for, for 18 months, is not in the Mississippi Delta. It's not one of the major sites of, um, of Freedom Summer and the work that continues after Freedom Summer. So, you know, I found him internally, they both their names are in different archival files, but a lot of it was just sort of the puzzle work of, of 
knowing some of the places <coughs> and knowing some of the campaigns that they worked on and trying to see what, what existed to actually um, surround that, you know, what, what other information I could find about that period. Um, so it's really a conversation between what the archives reveal, what the archives obscure, um, and, and the harm that was reflected. So uh, in a minute, we're going to move into uh, discussion for you, right? Uh, so my last sort of uh, foray to, to Michael is if you could talk a little bit about your thinking of Black Power 2023. <laughs> yeah, um, but let me just say, first of all, I've been just uh, been uh, living outside the country for like the last 20 years by and large, although I've come back and forth, but my residency up until this past September was completely best to Hungary, and so, and very involved with events there and, and engage, uh, intellectually engaged with, with events in this country, and uh, and one of the things that that, that I um, have always tried to do is that, like I view my experiences in SNCC as a learning experience that, uh, of, of how to organize and and uh, bring, trying to trying to engage people in in um, in struggle, uh, and but particularly from their from their communities, so that uh, and um, when I think of contemporary black. Um, Black power. That I think that it's 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 um, because the culture has changed so much since 1966 and and in, into the uh, 70s. But I think um, the the notion of just of black power is is not the same as we think about making up uh, organizations. I say that because I mean that like I grew up in my my uh, organizing. In a called black and white world, I mean, I, so that I mean, I, I honestly thought the only people who were oppressed were African Americans, particularly in terms of virulent uh, oppression. And and uh, today, as I look around the country, obviously, it, the world the world is much more complex than that. And that I think that um, that that black power needs to be understood as a way of on, on, of mobilizing. African Americans, but not limiting that that the mobilization to to African Americans. That I think that the uh, power of other oppressed people in this country, uh, be the the Latino community or, or Latinx community, I'm mean, I'm still catching up. Uh, 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 Asian community, and so forth. I think um, is also a reflection of what we what I think of as Black power. Because, because at its essence, we're talking about the people, the the power of oppressed people to uh, fight against the oppression and to determine how that fight takes place. That and that black power, I think, that its most its its essence is that the oppressed control their struggle, and um, and uh, to that degree. I see black power in a way that that really transcends the the word black, but looks at it in terms of a uh, the uh, the linkage of oppressed people throughout this country to move as, as one, and and that I tend not to think of it, and you know people like I tell people my uh, gay lesbian friends or my uh, 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 other nationalities I don't see myself as a quote ally. I see myself as, as, as I see my struggle as your struggle. Mm -hmm. And that like I do it not to uh, to support you but to support a in a bankrupt moral idea and composition. Uh, so that's what I would say. Yeah. Alright, so why don't we move into uh, well actually Aisha's here. I don't know if you want yeah, to add I'm not on camera, I moved down. Okay, all right. Um, I 
Yeah, I don't know really what to say. <laughs> okay, well, let's go. Yeah, okay, but I, yes, I'm Michael's daughter and Sahara's daughter. And uh, we're, um, was really happy to support Dan's uh, research and uh, through the archival photographs and also my, part of my story is, is told in, um, in, in uh, State on Freedom. And, uh, um, and so my work is that of, uh, I'm an activist, but my, and my work focuses on sexual violence and healing. And so one of the things that I, the many things that I appreciate the book, first and foremost, it's really powerful to, I've heard so many of these stories all of my life, and I'm soon to be 54. Um, and it's just also, it, but there's something about reading, and Dan is an excellent writer and brings you in. He's a storyteller par excellence. And I am biased, but I would tell you if it was boring, I'd be like, ooh. <laughs> um, but he brings you in. And so just kind of reading about my parents' third, third, uh, third person, and they've been separated since I was four, but just reading about them. And what I also appreciate about Dan and my parents is also talking about you know the, the shortcomings, the failures, the complexities. And so I think that that's really powerful because so often when we look at history, um, we're, we're looking at it in hindsight, it's 2020, and we're also, and particularly around any kind of figures, it's like to talk about the contradictions, to talk about the complexities, somehow um, diminishes the story. And I think that, in fact, it really um, makes the story stronger, particularly when we're talking about the struggle and the long road to struggle that we, we want to hear like, oh, Martin Luther King said a speech and then all of a sudden we got to, you know, use the bathrooms and vote and, you know, live happily ever after. Of course, we know that's not the case in terms of voting, Lord no. But I'm just saying, so, but to really kind of really look at who these, who these individuals are, um, how, how did they live in terms of not only their public facing work, but also their private facing work. And, and I did also want to add, you know, we weren't able to sort of get ourselves together enough to have Zahara join us uh, as a presenter, um, but she is participating on the Zoom for those who are uh, watching from, from home or whatever. Um, so, so I also just want to acknowledge that she is sort of in this space even if she's not on stage with her. Can I open it up for questions? Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, you talked a lot about doing the research, but how much, how much of this book is oral history? Like, um, can, is there, are we talking about hundreds of hundreds of hours of interviews? Uh, if you just talk a little bit about that. I know you mentioned Zoom, but like, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the, the question was how much of the book is, is oral history, um, and just to talk a little bit more about the, the process. Um, so uh, we, we began uh, working on the book, talking about the book in early 2016, um, and we did, an, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's listed in the back of the book, you know, a few dozen interviews, many of them over Zoom, um, some of them in person. Uh, I remember, you know, Mike and I spent like a weekend together in, in Philadelphia in 2019, and I, I wrote, <laughs> I had a brand new legal pad when I got through this house, and when we stopped talking at like one o'clock in the morning that first night, I just, Build that entire path and then some with just notes. And, um, so, you know, it, it was, some of it was in person, some of it was, was, uh, was remote and virtual. Zahara and I were, were in Memphis together. Um, I was in Florida. So, pre COVID, you know, things were, were differently possible. Um, and, then, and then a lot of time on Zoom uh, since 2020. So, you know, oral histories are, are the, the sort of foundation of the book. Um, but it's not just a, an as told to story. Uh -huh. So it really was important to me to do some of the archival, uh, not some, to do the archival work that I did. That it, you know, I didn't just sort of take what they said and, and shorten it and add sort of paragraphs, right? I, I 
really tried to, to expand upon what they said to sort of contextualize, um, to contextualize some of the experiences, to put their respective experiences in conversation with each other. I think, mean, you know, it was important in, in various ways, but, but two that I'll just highlight for now. One is that with, this, with the Atlanta project, as Michael discussed at the outset, you know, if you pick up any book on the civil rights movement, any book on SNCC, you will find many unkind things about the Atlanta project. Uh, and so it's one thing to just talk to them and hear like, oh, wasn't I like that? But, but actually, you know, I, you have to read the black consciousness papers to see what they were saying. Right? You have to sort of see the, the internal dialogue from SNCC about, <laughs> about firing, uh, firing some of the Atlanta Project staff members to like understand what, what that actually looked like right? and, 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 and to sort of give it a feel for it. Um, like that, likewise with the Laurel Project in the Sahara has many profound and vivid memories, but also to go through the SNCC records where they're just reporting like this, you know, a, a litany of of the white supremacist attacks on them, um, but also reporting some of the some of the organizing successes that they had. Um, ex, you know, I, I brought some of the archival work that I did back to them to say, hey, tell me about this thing that I found. You know, what, what, what do you remember about this? Or, or how, you know, um, how does this fit? So um, yeah, so you know the oral histories are, are the foundation, but also the archival work helped help me tell a fuller story and a, and a bigger story. And so it's not just uh, yeah, it's not just a bad told story. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you. <coughs> all right, thanks y'all for uh, thank you y'all for. Uh, just the conversation. Um, so, Michael, when you was talking about Malcolm in, in, in Philly in the 50s, it struck me. I thought about you, I thought about Muhammad Ahmed, I thought about Tony Montero, I thought about the number of, and those are just three three names that came to mind, there are several more who who went on to make, you know, really significant intellectual contributions to the Black Liberation Movement. And it's not lost on me that all of y'all are from 50, are from Philly, in that same age, and I wonder, right, there's something specific, it feels to me there's something specific about Philadelphia and its black intellectual tradition and the fact that so many movement theorists came out of that city in that period, and I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the specificity of Philadelphia and its role to the, to, to the and, and, and its role in contributing to the black movement. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Uh, how can I repeat it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the significance of Philadelphia. Yeah, the significance of Philadelphia and the evolution of the African American struggle. I mean, um, that, um, well, one that, yes, I, I agree with historically with, you know, with what you're saying, each other, the people uh, um, on one hand. But on the other hand, I'm not sure how, how unique Philadelphia is. I mean, when I look around the country, I mean, that um, that Philadelphia, like most um, urban areas with, uh, in terms of the African-American community, um, um, had African-Americans there going back to the 19th century, free African-Americans, if you will. But on the other hand, um, the Great Migration really impacted, uh, keep doing that, uh, uh, it impacted the development of, uh, of a political consciousness we talk in that environment. Quite often that that political consciousness came out of uh, the a the the middle class or petty bourgeoisie, if you will, um, in terms of the NAACP, in terms of uh, black church leaders who were uh, doing very progressive, positive things um, in Philadelphia or the Bethany on Sullivan organized a strike of various uh, stores of a uh, buy black campaign in the 40s and 50s. Uh, there were other people, but they were tended to, to um, um, not be rooted in the, uh, the, the level of oppression that, um, that, that, that said, it's one thing 
to have a buy black campaign is another thing to have money, I mean, uh, to buy black. <laughs> and, uh, so that, uh, and out of that tradition, I think that um, a grassroots elements emerged from around the city. Uh, that, um, uh, and I think that, that people began to look at other means of organizing. Uh, Marcus Garvey, for an example, had a, um, a, um, a car, car meeting hall on a street that's now known as Cecil B. Moore Avenue. And Cecil B. Moore transformed the Philadelphia NAACP from a kind of socially narrow middle class organization to a dynamic uh, grassroots organization. In fact, he was so successful that the, NAACP, the national NAACP broke it up into chapters so that Philadelphia had five separate NAACPs up until maybe 20 years ago, from the 60s up to 20 years ago. There was the North Philly branch, South Philly branch, et cetera. Um, in that context, I mean, uh, people like uh, Muhammad Ahmed, some people know the name as Max Stanford, uh, came out of uh, the a university outside of Philly, but formed a group called the Revolutionary Action Movement called RAM. A uh, person like, uh, uh, and I'm going by the names that were mentioned, but uh, uh, Tony Montel became a leading figure in the American Communist Party. Uh, I'm, these are people of my generation. And uh, so, um, um, but again, when I look at other cities, like Chicago, like New York, like uh, um, um, LA, I mean, there was, that, that I'm not sure how unique I would um, make Philadelphia. I would just say that I, I think that there is a Philadelphia story, but I don't want to suggest that that story is in any way more profound or significant than the Chicago story or the Baltimore story. So. We have a question from Zoom. It's actually from Charles Cubby. Uh, Julie Bob made his first run for the Georgia State Legislature as the Atlanta project unfolded. What was the project's attitude about the campaign and electoral politics in general? Was it the route to black power in your view? Oh, oh I think you're asking that. Yeah, that, yeah, the fact, um, um, the, the, the people who constituted the Atlanta project had uh, nothing to do with Julian's campaign. In fact, Charlie Cobb actually uh, was, was one of the key architects of it, uh, uh, and uh, Judy Richardson. Um, so that um, 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 that was not so much a, a part of our consciousness. I think that um, that that uh, at that point in our lives, that like we tended to look at at. Uh, traditional political parties and in the context of creating third parties um, or, or creating a, a consciousness that clearly went to the left wing of the uh, Democratic Party. In fact, our, our time, the Atlanta Project's time in Atlanta was a, a uh, failed attempt to try to start a uh, third party within the uh, uh, state of Georgia. I mean, we made some um, for modest successes, but when you step back and look at it, it was clearly a failure. But so, but we definitely encouraged people to vote, and uh, and saw the voting as uh, as but one method of social change. So that we did not view uh, uh, view it as a savior, as a, and um, that so that in, in terms of SNCC in general, not just the Atlanta Project, when Georgia was elected, people saw SNCC at that, that Julian had a constituency that he had to be responsible to. It was not that Julian, like most of the, these days people get elected and then they tell their constituencies what to think about <laughs> the possibilities of their environment. And like our view was that, and continues to be my view, that like, um, the election is the first process, first part of the process, but it's not the end of the process. And the power relationship should not fundamentally change as a result of the election. 
And with all due speaking, I think that for Julian, you out his electoral uh, history in Georgia reflected that consciousness of being responsible for his constituents. And more than, yeah, the, the campaign issues that Baum ran on were, were SNCC issues, right? They, they were the issues of Vine City, and I think the same could be said in Lowndes County, Alabama, where SNCC also uh, pursued a similar kind of political project around the same time. But I mean, the, the issues that Julian Baum ran on are things that still needed today, right? <laughs> seventeen dollars minimum wage, and the death penalty, uh, and then the right to work laws, um, uh, dealing with slum, slum housing. Um, but I, you know, I think for me, one of the key things about the Atlanta Project is this kind of convergence of, of issues. Right? So it was an attempt uh, to, to defend electoral victories. Right? The Atlanta Project wasn't, wasn't the initial uh, effort to elect Bond, but was a sort of defensive measure to try and re-elect him when he was denied his seat. And so there was already from the outset, a recognition that electoral politics weren't weren't enough right? <laughs> within the Atlanta project because they only existed because Baum was not able to to take his seat when he was supposed to. So it was you know it's already sort of pushing down electoral politics. But I think that has to come together with um, you know particularly a recognition of, of U.S. imperialism and, and the war in Vietnam um, and. Uh, that, that sort of pushed the project to, to sort of make these sort of global connections. Um, I thought I might read a, a quick excerpt, but yeah. Zahara had a response oh, to Oh, please. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, 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 please. Uh, so she said, hi, Charlie. I think it was um, the Julian Bond run was a model for how I wish the case for all black elected officials, i.e. those who have run or grounded in the movement and remain uh, rooted there and are answerable to that movement. This is opposed to most of the black elected officials today. These elected officials' loyalty is to the Democratic Party and not to the communities that elected them. There's no black opposition to US foreign policy, for example. This includes no opposition to imperialism in Africa or anywhere else. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess one uh, dramatic moment in the book and, and I think key moment in the Atlanta Project was comes out of sort of anti-militarism organizing and the work that um, well, the, Michael attempts to, to resist being inducted into the military um, that led to you know, a series of sort of increasingly raucous demonstrations where uh, that culminated in, in his arrest on, on his induction day in August of 1966. So I wanted to just read a, a, a passage about that time period and, and its aftermath, and, and then uh, we can keep, keep chatting. But um, okay, Mike was one of ten men and two women arrested outside the induction center. He felt especially bad for the two women who were not Atlanta Project regulars. Now they faced the wrath of an irate Atlanta legal system. Everyone was charged with disturbance, and most were also charged with resisting arrest and failure to obey an officer. One of the group was also charged with insurrection. It carried a possible death sentence. The trial, such as it was, happened the next day. <coughs> Captain Redding, the local police officer assigned to monitor the Atlanta Project, played the role of prosecutor. Judge T.C. Little found the defendants guilty of all charges, remanding the case of insurrection to a higher court to decide. Addressing SNCC lawyer Howard Moore with a colloquial disregard, Little declared, quote, but you see, Colonel, I'm not giving them stiff sentences based on their color, but because I have a son in Vietnam who is fighting to defend the principles of freedom and democracy. Then he sentenced the group to serve between 90 and 120 days. Back at the project office, Gwen, as the horror was known at the time, got to work writing a press release, informing their comrades, and drafting new leaflets. She also organized the next day's picket outside the induction center. Over the weekend, she held vigil in Vine City, the mood alternated between festive and morose. During the day, Bill Ware denounced the black police officers surrounding them as, quote, white men in black skin, while Gwen and others passed out flyers. They denounced the war in Vietnam and the arrests, hoping to raise money to support their prison comrades. In the evening, they brought out a barbecue grill, connected the sound system to the record player, and partied in the streets. The following week, Gwen was back in front of the induction center at 6.30 a.m. Now, the group was almost entirely women. 
police mocked them, and two black officers followed the group as they left. Once they left downtown, the woman confronted the police. You are a disgrace to black women, friend challenged. How can you stand there while white cops make fun of black women who are protesting the killing of our black brothers in a racist war? Gwen brought her fury at the war, the arrests, the intractability of it all to the next day's demonstration. The feeling of their outrage was too easily absorbed by the back and forth shouting they had done with soldiers all week. Gwen shifted tact. Instead, at 6.45 a.m., she led a group of five women to the induction center dressed head to toe in black. Silently, they carried signs reading, we mourn the drafting of black men, and we mourn the 400 years of lynching and castration of the black men in the country, and we wonder why the white man feels the necessity to castrate and lynch black men. They held vigils outside the induction center and then moved their somber procession to downtown, where black women would see them on their way to work. Some of the women recognized the SNCC activists, sources of regular literature on war and racism. Where you been, one of them demanded of Gwen. You made me late. I've been here waiting on you. The women grabbed the flyer, lamenting, now I gotta say to my white lady why I'm late. You know that, that I do want to just raise up because Zahar is not here in person, um, the, the, while the book talks about us in a uh, chronological sense and the interaction that, like, her, her reality was uh, much harsher than mine, um, and in, in no way would I uh, particularly her early reality in terms of one growing up in Memphis, for all the racism that I experienced in Philadelphia, it doesn't even come close to the, the violence that um, that uh, Zahara experienced. That um, when I look at at the uh, issue of African American women leadership, and in particular the civil rights movement, that I think that um, that uh, she had a struggle beyond the struggle that I had. In fact, in some cases the struggle with me um, um, as a comrade fighting for the same issues. I mean, a, the plight that, that oppressed women throughout the uh, struggle for the liberation I have had to deal with is uh, fighting for the overall goal, but also having to uh, deal with the internal contradictions of sexism. And clearly, that was one thing that, like, I always point out that, you know, you, when, when the one of the most exalted events of the civil rights movement is the March on Washington. And not one woman spoke. Now, it's not that they had to get some political co-development from Dorothy Hyde of the National, uh, um, uh, all of a sudden the name escaped me, but National Council of Negro Women, uh, to uh, Dorothy Danridge from not right down the road here, in uh, Cambridge, Maryland, to uh, Ella Carl Baker, responsible for there being a SNCC, um, uh, Diane Nash, who was the coordinator of the Freedom Rides uh, from Nashville, and on and on and on. That every time I go to Atlanta and, and I see, the, you know, they just renamed it the whole city. So you got. Ralph Abernathy Boulevard, Martin Luther King Boulevard, uh, Hosea Williams, Field. not that these people don't deserve uh, um, honor and respect, but not one woman, not one. And to this day, unless something happened in the last year or so, and I think that just when we look at, at the issue of sexism in the movement, that I think that us, particularly the progressives, that like, we have to be willing to talk about that history, uh, talk about its its lingering effects and its lingering reality. And I, and I think Zahara has done uh, both through her work and her life is, it really reflects that. But I'm really interested in the kind of the latter years of the thing. I feel like a lot of attention, important attention, is put on you know SNCC and some rights movement, and a little bit around your um, induction debt and, and incarceration. In terms of what I've heard in conversation, so it'd be interesting, you know, to really talk about what happens after that period. Um, I just think it's it's 
because this is called, the, the book is, the subtitle is The Long History of Black Power. And so it doesn't, you all didn't, you and my mother did not stop at 1972. You kept going, you're still going in, in 2023. And so I just would like to hear more about that. Yeah, well, so we too, I mean, what our paths often intersected after the, um, we, our, our marriage broke up, but um, we, we, we continued struggling in, in a different ways, and, and I hesitate speaking for uh, Zahar in some regards, but, but her struggle was as much a spiritual struggle as it was a practical struggle regarding um, uh, social change, which she felt feel is all part of one. Um, that in terms of myself, that, I mean, we, we go, I mentioned my uh, two and a half years in jail, coming out, um, that I was very, um, that I've always been trying to organize something. And so that, that through, uh, through an employment opportunity, I was able, to, uh, I should say I was able, that I was, well, I was, I met other uh, assembly-minded people uh, from Seattle, Washington, Tyree Scott being one of them, Ty Hawkins, and we organized a group called the Southwest Worker Federation in the states of Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Texas, a group of African-American co-workers, men and women, organized around class action lawsuits. That's just one thing. I was, um, I was very involved with um, the uh, anti-apartheid movement and had the, had the opportunity and the resources to play a uh, significant role in the, di the early divestment movement before it kind of became a mainstream, uh, trying to challenge the American Defense Service Committee to divest its interests, but also um, fighting the interest of people or the, the uh, policy of people who were opposed to divestment. Um, subsequently, uh, becoming the, the um, coordinator for Europe or the Director for European Affairs, spent time in the Soviet Union um, engaging um, Soviet intellectuals with American intellectuals around the issue of nuclear weapons, human rights uh, issues, and um, at the end of communism, and, and I'm really giving you a <laughs> but at the end of communism, um, began to really get into the, the Eastern European reality, post-communist reality of uh, uh, because it was much more openness to to the citizens of the former Soviet Union. And to that degree, um, began to really try to organize around racism, sexism, homophobia, and xenophobia. Xenophobia being specifically focused on Roma in, uh, in, in, in uh, Central Europe. Um, that I did, but it, it all had to say that, that, that everything I've done had been me trying to apply what I had learned really in my early days in SNCC to other situations, which is um, which is not to be dogmatic about that, but is to say that, uh, that that I think that that we in this country have developed a certain uh, organizing realities and principles that I think um, are very useful to other oppressed peoples, regardless of uh, uh, where they live. Yeah, I um, really appreciate the, the prompt, Aisha, yeah. because uh, we, we talked mostly about the first half of the book. But, um, yeah. but you know, one of the things that really um, motivated me and interested me in, in the project is you know, going from a time when it seemed like you know, revolution or some kind of dramatic change was, was imminent to realizing that it's not, and yet, how do you keep going? Right? And, and what are the ways that, that uh, what are the forms that that looks like? What are the forms of, of, that, uh, forms of struggle that, that take shape? Um, and for both Michael and Zara, in, in different but complementary ways, uh, that included a, a deepening engagement with the world, right? so a sort of deepening internationalism. So Michael talked about, you know, briefly, but uh, importantly about some of his um, journey, Zahara was one of the, was, was part of the first American delegation to Cambodia after the fall of Pol Pot, uh, so after, the, um, after the U.S. left Vietnam, but, but while there was still different um, fighting in the region, um, she, uh, she 
spent several years studying in Jordan and also in the Middle East and was a founding member of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Um, and so I, I think, and, and many other things <laughs> as well, but I, I think for both of them, that sense of growing internationalism um, was a reflection not only of what was happening in the world, and the connection to different people's struggles, which in many parts of the world were, were more um, advanced than what was happening in the US. Um, but also a way to, to sort of learn and struggle alongside people of the world while they were doing local work in Philadelphia or elsewhere. Um, and so I really think that, that sense of, you know, what do you do, right? <laughs> How do you keep going? Um, and that sense of internationalism is, is a really key element of black power after the early 70s. Yeah, uh, more from Zahar. She says, um, Dorothy, oh, which is wonderful, please keep it coming. Um, Dorothy Height and the other women of color, and other women of color, met at the NCNW headquarters out of outreach about women being left off the stage of the March in Washington and laying the foundation for what was to become the National Organization of Women. This, too, was left out of the history of the women's movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's, and that's, that's really important. And also, uh, again, you know, the um, cause. Azahar was was uh, was willing to to be one of the uh, uh, first initiators, and I don't want to say that that she was first, but of uh, what we now think of as Black feminism, and uh, and part of that is having to again, in this case, struggle with white feminism in terms of the issues uh, that um, um, and and that in that regard that trying to develop a, a framework because, you know, as I like to, to used to tell people, still do tell people that uh, my mother left home at 12 years old from Rock Hill, South Carolina in, in the mix of the depression uh, in, the, in the 30s to come to Philadelphia because she was so poor and she wanted to make money to send back home and uh, or make money meant $5 a week. Um, so that all her life, her, her thing was, I will be happy to not have to go to work, that I can be home, keep my house clean, et cetera, et cetera. So then she comes up against women who say, oh, no, 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 you can't. That's not the right position. So I so, now my mother uh, supported abortion rights, uh, felt that a woman could do anything a man could do that never ever backed down from any man, my father or <laughs> anyone else. And yet she was told she wasn't a feminist because she wanted to go to work every day as she'd been doing all her life. I say that to say that 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 the African American the women like so hard framed feminism in a new reality. So it wasn't just joining the what people view as the mainstream feminist movement. But really redefining it and in and, and, and the reality of working class people, which goes beyond even the African American community. Mm. We have another question from Zoom. This is from I for Dan. Uh, what are the ways that you conceptualize your book as part of the ongoing black power movement? How does this kind of work contribute to a liberatory future? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, oftentimes when you talk about black power, the the histories are of particular organizations and tend to be pretty uh, limited in time period. And so, again, I, I really wanted to sort of ex explode that frame. And I think when we, um, this to me was, was part of, there are other ways to do it, but for me, it's part of why I thought biography was an important genre to do that. When you follow, you know, individuals who, uh, you know, who survived the period, and obviously not everyone did, um, you see that it's not, you know, that, that people outlive certain organizations, they try different strategies and different approaches. Um, but, uh, but I think, and, and, and that's valuable, right? And I, I think that's, that's part of what we should understand, you know, of, of a larger black freedom politics or, or even a larger left wing politics. Um, but why I think that is useful, particularly with black power, is that I think the, 
the experiences that like of the are brought to the development of black power and what they learned from from the work in black power continued with them sort of after that heyday. Right? So the book talks about black power as both a paradigm and a movement, and the movement, uh, you know, the sort of heyday of the movement may have subsided by the mid-70s, but I think the the lessons about self-determination, about uh, you know, sort of solidarity, not just allyship, um, and, uh, and uh, solidarity, you know, and self-determination, um, and, and just sort of grappling directly with questions of power are things that Michael brought to the work he was doing with Roma communities, things that Sahara brought to, um, to, to you know, human rights uh, delegations to uh, the Middle East, um, and to the question of Palestine, even within how ostensibly progressive organizations responded or didn't respond uh, there. So right, I think what they learned in Black Power, as well as what they brought to Black Power, has continued to um, characterize or define, not in an exclusive way or a limited way, but has continued to, to characterize their sort of political work. Oh, yeah. since I was a younger self. That it is so much easier now to find out the things that were fundamental to me that led me into SNCC. It is so much easier to get that information now. Um, so that, uh, for an example, um, Carl, I was coming up as a, a young person. I mean, that there, there were virtually no place that I knew I could go um, to get information about African American history. Um, so that um, that like I, I literally walked the streets um, and and was fortunate enough to find a, a bookstore that was run by an African American communist who had started the bookstore because his comrades were getting rid of their books out of the, the Red Scare, as it's, it's known now. Um, and so he collected books, literally, and started a bookstore, the New World Bookstore in Philadelphia. Um, and I was so fortunate to have met him, though when I did, uh, I was a teenager, and he would sit me down and just talk to me about Paul Robeson, uh, I don't know if you, but the the attacks on him in upstate New York, a place called Peekskill, uh, they talked to me about W.B. Du Bois and uh, the Pan-African movement, I mean, things that just were not part of my formal education. So that today, those that kind of information is so readily accessible. You know, yeah, you know we have back in the history uh, year, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, uh, seriously, month. Uh, and um, so, I, so when, I, when I think about uh, my younger self, I just cannot imagine I would not have been a part of the George Floyd protest and the, uh, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter protest um, that I cannot imagine that in um, Philadelphia that like, I, I would not have been a part or not be a part of some of the uh, educational issues facing poor people in general, African Americans in particular. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I mean that. So that 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 tends to be how I how I see it. I, I mean, one of the things about me, I mean, uh, that I, you know, now that I'm the age that I am, I tend to regret. Uh, no, no, that's not. I shouldn't say regret, but I could have done could better at planning. Is um, the employment situations where I, where I would have a higher a retirement check. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but but uh, but but mean, that's some serious and some and, and, and some human. But but like I, I really don't think it would mind that like, I would have said go forth. In fact, my, my dream is I really to find someone who who had the inquisitive mind that I did who would come talk to me, and I would be able to turn their life around in the way that my life was turned around when I met uh, people like Bill Crawford. Yeah, yeah I'm curious, um, something you brought up made me think of like, you know, we're very much parallels between this moment and like the late 60s, mid 60s, and you know, for someone who hasn't lived it in terms of like, we're this moment of abolition, right? Ab abolish the police, abolish the prisons, all that. Like, I guess my question is around like, to what degree was that, I don't feel like that language was that prevalent then, but examples were, right? So like I'm thinking about Black Panther Party, 10 point program, Cop Watch, things that were happening then. Yeah, I guess to what, ex to what extent do you feel like there are examples of abolition to draw from or learn from for folks, younger folks in 2023, looking back, <coughs> looking back to those years? I'm sorry, could you? Before I'm, then I'm before trying. I before. feel like there were, like you said, like re it seemed like re revolution was imminent, right? Mm. And I, I don't know if I would describe this moment like that, but I would say a lot of people are moving their politics from like reform to abolish, uh, to abolitionist. In studying this era, I don't, I don't read a lot of language of abolition, but I, I may be wrong. But I feel like there are a lot of examples of fighting for versions of abolition, right? Yeah. And so that, that's basically the question, Mike. Sure, yeah. but I'll just repeat for you. So, um, so, so the question was, uh, you know, and, and let me know if I am being clear, but, um, but if, uh, you know, to, to what extent do we find sort of histories or, or examples of abolitionism in this time period? Yes. Or um, given, given how much that defines our present moment. Correct. Is that thank, thank you. That was much better said. No, no, I was just doing for Zoom people. I just want to make sure I didn't, yeah. uh, I didn't mangle it. Uh, um, yeah, you know, I, I think it's a good question. I, I have, um, I think there would be a great project for someone to do on a history of abolition since slavery, right? Because often they talk about abolition as like, well, there was this slavery abolition movement, and then there's like the last five years, 10 years, 20 years, depending on who you're talking to, <laughs> when, they would, when they would date the sort of present moment of abolition. Mm -hmm. But I think there's actually a really uh, important, profound history of abolition that runs from, from the you know, abolition of slavery to the present, not, you know, it, it winds and bends and takes different twists and turns, but there's abolition at every moment, so you can read and you should read, uh, you know, one should read uh, Eugene Debs' uh, Walls and Bars book about his time in prison. Okay. He is consistently talking about abolishing the prison system, right? that, that prison of the world. Okay. There are a number of um, uh, you know, civil rights activists prior to the 1950s and 60s, you know, in the 30s and 40s, who are talking about abolish Jim Crow. Um, you, you know, there was the uh, movement to abolish nuclear weapons uh, that, you know, I mean, if you want to be more ideological about it, you can certainly see a sort of Marxist um, campaigns or Marxist uh, framework about abolishing capitalism being framed in those terms. So I think, you know, abolition as a, uh, not just a sort of maximalist demand, but a, you know, experimental and expansive framework for how we, we pursue the world that we want and the world that we need is a through line. And, and I think it's a through line that owes 
heavily to the movement uh, that abolished slavery, but because but because of that movement, it, it also expanded elsewhere, right? And, and, uh, and can be found in all, in all these other places in all these other ways. Um, I also think that as it's continued, what, what, what we mean by abolition have, has changed. One of the ways it's changed is that people have, you know, I, I think particularly uh, you know, queer and trans feminists have expanded the framework of abolition in all manner of ways. And, and Aisha's work on um, confronting uh, rape and sexual violence and child sexual abuse uh, without the carceral state is, is one example of that. Um, but I also think, you know, prior to the 90s, let's say, I think the idea was, well, because I'm a socialist, I believe in abolition. And I think what shifted in a post Cold War, post Soviet you know, world where the idea of state communism is not the same alternative that it, that it once seemed to be, <coughs> is that abolition becomes the overarching framework. Right? So it's not because I'm X, I'm an abolitionist, it is I'm an abolitionist, right? <laughs> or, or because I'm an abolitionist, I'm a socialist. Um, right? And so I think that, I think abolition has grown in its capaciousness to, to be a, a political ideology framework platform um, in ways that maybe it, it wasn't at other moments of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But I think abolition is, is everywhere in the 20th century, <laughs> or in, in 20th century. <coughs> yeah, can just, just to go footnote to what, uh, a go footnote to what Dan said is that to me, you know, the, the you know, many of the slogans um, that, that have come out over, over the uh, period that Dan just uh, uh, chronicled um, imply abolition. So when you say, you know, Mississippi, one man, one vote, I mean, th those words go beyond those words. I mean, I mean, the reality goes beyond those words. I think uh, struggling um, against uh, sexism, I think that, that, that abolition is, is, is implied in that, at least um, for me, so that sometimes the notion of abolition is not overtly stated, but clearly implied if we're successful with our goals. <clears throat> so we have another point from Sahara here. She says, in my view, today we need a big tent movement that brings us together around big issues while continuing to work on the individual issues, racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. The big issues are putting brakes on unbridled capitalism and the promotion of socialism, challenging U.S. imperialism, Development people party rather than the structural change in this country. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd be remiss if we didn't ask you to talk a little bit more about political education. Uh, so I'm thinking in particular um, about the role of SNCC, the you know, freedom schools, freedom libraries, but also the interest in the part of the school. This is where we need some art. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Zahara is very um, uh, consistent and, and, and eloquent on this point. But you know, she she went to Mississippi to do to, to be a freedom school teacher. Um, but I think that experience of freedom schools and what what freedom education meant was something that she returned to a lot. So you know, she talked about um, the period in her life that's uh, in the book a little bit where she was working as like a youth and family uh, educator. Um, and one of the things she did was, was a kind of freedom, uh, freedom education style project in the 1970s. Um, she also uh, had an AFSC project for investigating state surveillance where political education about surveillance and what the surveillance regime was doing and how it was constructed and who it targeted you know, require that kind of political education. So, you know, I, I think Michael was saying at an event we did yesterday about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. Um, and I think that's, that's a, a generative tension to, to think more about. Um, but at every step, you know, not only are they engaged in political education because that's what organizing requires, but I also think that, that they are educating themselves, right? And that, and that their own political education and their own 
program for digital development is a constant. And so I think that, that is recognizing both sides, I mean, it is, is true sort of Paulo Freire sort of style of what, of what liberatory education is. Um, but I really think that that's true. Right? And I hope that that comes across in the book as well. And this, I think it's, it's, it's really significant the, the current tax on the education process by the uh, right wing Republicans. I mean, uh, that uh, uh, I mean, regardless of its objective absurdity in today's technological world, that what you, um, I mean, that like they may be able to prevent people from taking academic courses, but they surely cannot prevent the information from. Uh, being out and, uh, and and I think that that political education becomes so important in the um, the uh, formal education process. And, and, and when I say so important, that um, a lot of people, um, from my experience in jail, got politically organized as they began to think about politics and history. And I think that the fear. Uh, I mean, that it's no accident during slavery that you couldn't teach people to read. I mean, um, um, that, uh, so that, you know, these things, these, these tips to, to obstruct um, the but development, the, the intellectual development of oppressed people have a long history. And I think that, that the freedom school model that uh, SNCC came up with, in fact, one of our uh, questioners, uh, Zahar, as long as uh, uh, Charlie Tom Jr., that model has been taken throughout the world in terms of, of educating oppressed people to their history and the methods of relieving their oppression. Thank you. All right, so I think we're gonna wrap up here. Um, so before we do, I wanna thank both of our panelists. happening Thursday, February 23rd from 6.30 to 8 in DuPont Circle. So if you come, you'll hear from sex workers and a sex work one-on-one -on -one presentation facilitated by the Incredible Tips, a local harm reduction services advocacy and community engagement group. So come learn why sex work could decriminalization is a socialist issue. In addition, another event we have coming up is we're going to have the, uh, another walking tour on Plutocratic DC. That's going to be Saturday, March 18th. Um, if you've never been to one of these tours, they get people out to come together um, protect locations around DC to the histories of capitalism and imperialism. Um, this one's gonna start at City Center and the tour group will visit some other sites connected to contemporary forms of extreme wealth in downtown DC. So make sure to sign up in advance for this so you can get connected to day, uh, day of updates and also volunteer roles. And the Zoom link for that will be also posted in the chat. Um, I also have a QR code here for that link. And then lastly, if you're not a member of TSA and you want to join, you can do so at mdcdsa.org slash join. And again, I've got the, those links here for you. And with that, uh, thank you. Thank you. Can I, uh, also, just uh, remind slash encourage people that the book is yes. for sale uh, in the back, but we share you would know more about it. Yes, yeah, so we have a limited amount of copies, so please come over and, and you'll have an opportunity to sign copy today. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.